Hey, welcome everybody. It's May 4th, 2020. I'm Matthew Brownstein. These are the Monday night, although it's afternoon here in California time. Uh, these are the Monday night conscious community classes. And I'm excited about this one. This is a class called Meditations on Higher Consciousness. And it's actually, I'm not here to sell you anything tonight at all, but it's actually a product that I had made uh, many years ago, back in 2005. And I sold it on CDs for a while. And then as soon as we started putting everything in MP3 and online, I never actually launched this. So again, I'm not here to sell you anything at all. Um, I wanna deliver all this material, you know, absolutely no charge. And then I'm gonna show you where I posted all of those, what used to be products on YouTube, just to give this stuff away. Uh, it's interesting, it's a smaller group tonight, and I always knew publishing this stuff, people just wouldn't be as interested in the really deep teachings, um, which is understandable, right? So I'm gonna pretty much jump right in. If you consider a bell curve, you know, like that, um, at the far end, you're gonna have, well, let's say on this end, you have people who might be in the category, no judgment here at all, but very much not functional, right? Barely able to, um, survive on this planet. Uh, again, I don't want to even give types, but you can imagine people are just not doing very well at all. And there's a huge amount of people who are struggling, especially now, of course, with COVID. And then you have like, you know, the average, the masses. And then there's people who are really thriving and exceptionally well-rounded in all aspects of their life, you know, like true masters, life mastery type of level thinking, self-actualized beings, self-realized beings, uh, very successful. And I would put way over here, honestly, the kind of teachings we're gonna go into tonight from the deeper spiritual or meditative teachings. The information is gonna go much deeper than what we get in most hypnotic materials. And a lot of you have been through our training actually will know this information to a degree uh, comes it's definitely introduced in the transpersonal materials uh, so i'm going to take you through a brief powerpoint just to orient us to where we are tonight make a special announcement for next week's class and uh, then we'll use the powerpoint just to do a brief overview and um, tonight should go into some pretty deep teachings along with four different if we can get through them tonight, uh, four different meditations. But even if we don't get through them in this recording or this class, I will be happy to show you, which I'm gonna do right now, where you can find the information on YouTube, because pretty much all of this I have taught before. So let me figure out how to screen share again. All right, let's get through this quickly. I'm not a huge fan of taking you through the same PowerPoint over and over, but I did modify it a lot for tonight's class. So these are the Monday Night Conscious Community Classes with me, Matthew Brownstein. Um, we'll get into my bio in a sec. We have three websites, just so you kind of know who we are online. Instituteofhypnotherapy.com is our main website. Student portal is tfioh.com. And our association, Interpersonal Hypnotherapy. International Association of Interpersonal Hypnotherapists is interpersonalhypnotherapy.com. I launched the Monday Night Conscious Community classes again about five weeks ago because of COVID-19, and I hope it's really been supporting a lot of people, and I've been able to post these on YouTube because we're using Zoom, so that's been good. Uh, here's my bullet points about me. The thing I'll say tonight, in case you don't know my background, I've spent a lot of time living in spiritual communities after a degree in religion and philosophy, where I didn't know what I was going to really do with that. Um, I really just wanted to be a monk is all I wanted to do. I just wanted to be in a monastery. Uh, but for many reasons, that didn't happen. So I spent a lot of time living in those communities, like a lot, about five total years. Um, and I would say deep down in heart, I'm a monk. <laughs> um, I'm definitely in a closet yogi. I spend tons of time in yoga and meditation. At the bottom, you see I've written five books on these themes. And one is Peace Under All Circumstances, which has become very relevant during COVID times. And I'll show you where that is online as well, because uh, that's all free now. This is some of the examples of what we cover in these Monday night classes, not necessarily just hypnotherapy. This is a chance for me to offer some of the deeper spiritual teachings that led me into the field of hypnotherapy. And why I'm so passionate about hypnotherapy is it complements spirituality so well. Um, our main brand is interpersonal hypnotherapy. And I hope everybody will keep asking, you know, what is that? Because it's not necessarily as simple or as basic as it sounds. In fact, I'll just say briefly, because we're going to deep meditative stuff tonight. I was in deep meditation one night. I was communing with spirit. I know there's different ways to describe that inner 
process of communing with higher wisdom. Um, but again, tonight is meditations on higher consciousness, so we can go there in a beautiful way. And I asked, what is hypnotherapy? And, you know, what like, really is it? And I, I asked, I said, is it transpersonal? You know, what's the depth, the essence of it? Is it transpersonal that we're leading people into their connection with to spirit? And the voice, spirit, came back and said, it's interpersonal. I was like, wow. So that wasn't just Matthew making something up. A lot of the stuff that I share has come to me through my own meditations. And that word is very deep. I won't go into it now. That's worthy of an entire two-hour class. But I hope everybody who's part of the school will really explore why are we using that word. It's not just a catchy brand name. It's actually a very deep way of expressing what we do. All right, um, we do, if you're new to the school, if you've never been through, we offer the first four and a half hours for free. And here it says 10 hours of class, but the truth is we have well over 400 of free hours that we give away, but people are intimidated by that in our marketing, <laughs> so I drop it to 10. But we have tons of extra material that we do give away for free. I'll show you, that's here. So 400 hours of the past conscious community classes can be found uh, at that link. Um, so both of our websites, if you, browse around enough, you'll find them, the two school websites. We have our locations around the country, our June class is enrolling with me, and there's Danny Fox on the left, she'll be teaching in Tampa in June, and I will be teaching in Santa Barbara in June. Uh, and then we have the other locations around the country, that's Renuka Arjun, our wonderful Hollywood director. We did have to cancel our conference because of COVID, it's not canceled, it's postponed until it's safe for us to all be in the same room together. We're not gonna do it virtually, it's just too precious to be in person together. Peace under all circumstances, a major theme that I've, my basic teachings, so, you know, some of what I teach brought into these classes and online now on YouTube and whatnot because of COVID, so I'll show you where that is. Um, this is Danny Fox, our Tampa director, and Danny will be my guest next week. I hope you tune in. Danny's a very successful graduate. Her bio is way too big to cover right now, as she's pointed out to me, Danny. <laughs> um, so, yes, it can never do justice. That wonderful Danny is. She'll be my special guest next week, and she runs a very successful private practice. Uh, is doing extremely well. So she's a great role model and teacher and friend. All right, uh, meditations on higher consciousness. This is tonight's topic. Now we'll go back to the chat pod in a sec because I see people are typing. Let's do that before we get too far here. Uh, right, I'm going to stop sharing. We'll come back to that. Okay, great. Um, okay, nothing specific for me, guys, there. All right, great. So we're going to get into the topic tonight meditations on higher consciousness, but honestly, <laughs> I could have stayed with that. Um, the slide is the best way to get started. Okay, so the topics, we're gonna to use Sanskrit because it's cool. <laughs> um, Sanskrit gives you a roadmap of the terrain that English just cannot do. Um, so I lived in India, and even though I started studying this stuff in my early 20s is a religion major in college, studying a lot of Eastern mysticism and philosophies and psychologies. Um, I didn't even know how to pronounce a lot of these words properly. They certainly in the West are not well transliterated or even translated. Uh, and so it takes a lot of study. And if you understand the sound vibration of each word, that actually helps in the process. So some of these words may be spelled differently than what you might search if you wanna go deeper into this stuff, you know, on YouTube or whatever, because that's where all wisdom now is. Um, so we'll get into tonight the themes of Vivek and Viragya. Those are considered the two jewels of yogic philosophy, the two gems. And I'll just give you the brief, um, translation of these words now. Vivek is to discern. Um, you might say discriminate, but that's not a popular word these days. So discernment is the ability to say, this is not that, and that is not this. And in meditation, it's an extremely valuable habit to get into. It's an inner reflex that we develop in deep meditation. Viragya could be said to be letting go. It's possibly one of the best translations. Um, so discerning, let's just jump right in for a moment, the real from the unreal, what's really true and what's just an illusion, right? And if there is something called truth and illusion, which I would say there is because we have those words, right? So they refer to something. Vivek is to know the difference. And then Viragya is to let go of illusions. <laughs> um, it's basically what it comes down to. And it's not just a philosophy. 
or a way to live your life. It's actually how you can, you don't have to, but it's how you can meditate. And the rewards are so valuable. Um, you know, I want to get into tonight what this stuff will make you feel every day, even during COVID-19 times. And it's a rough time right now on the planet, you know, especially for us humans. And or those of us pretending to be human. Um, and what I can say is you can still be in so much bliss right now. You know, I watched the news this morning. My human felt sad, but I can tell you my inner being is so full of peace. And I want to share that with you guys. So we'll get into tonight. What do these meditative states allow you to feel like inside, regardless of external conditions? Ashtang yoga are the eight limbs of yogic practice. And uh, they're not necessarily linear. You can practice all of them kind of all the time, but we're going to review that a bit tonight because it becomes a very powerful foundation to learn how to go into the deepest, and I do mean deepest, uh, deepest meditative states. Sham Dhyan, Sham could be loosely translated, but the, no one word does justice, as space. Um, Sham is actually one of the deeper names of Krishna in Hinduism. And Krishna is, if you translate it directly, he's kind of like the blue black one. Uh, extremely beautiful, very desirable. And Sham is like the space of pure conscious awareness. When you're in touch with the, I'm just going to kind of go all out tonight with not filtering very much my words like I usually do in our school. Um, Sham is the beloved. Sham is the essence of, you know, you could use the word God for that. Uh, I don't use that word much either, but again, this is deep stuff tonight. Um, but even the word God, there's so many better words in Sanskrit that help us to understand, you know, if I just say God, there's so many meanings to that. But if I say Sham, there's a very clear meaning to that. Uh, and I'll get into that later when we get to the topic. Dhyan is another simple, simply translated meditation. But again, you might mean something totally different than I do. So Sham Dhyan is meditation on the space of pure consciousness or on absolute bliss consciousness. And if you're not feeling that most of the time, honestly, something's wrong. <laughs> and I want to get into that tonight. You know, like, Where are you living? Are you living in the space of absolute bliss consciousness most of the time? Uh, or are you not? You know, and you know what it's like to not be. Uh, and maybe I'll do a brief little meditation that can orient us to how are you doing you know, during this time? It's a horrible thing right now. Um, you know, COVID is, is absolutely awful. And yet deep meditators know how to stay at peace no matter what. And, you know, what a gift. Bharat Swarup. Uh, well, that's a big one. Um, cosmic consciousness. Um, but really the translation here is the vision of the cosmic self. It's your experience of one of the deepest possible meditation. It's not a visualization. I'll take you on a, most likely if we get to it, I'll take you on a visualization meditation of that tonight with the understanding that imagination is not what this is all about. Bharat Swarup is you experiencing yourself as a universe in a cosmic way you know, planets, galaxies, I mean, no small stuff. And if you don't think that's possible, well, you're wrong. <laughs> so um, that's worth getting into. And then samadhi is the real essence of all of this. That word basically could be translated as oneness. Yet again, I use these words because there's no English word that does justice to how, what are we, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's like nine, ten words on the screen right there in the bullet points. And it'll take at least uh, two years to explain that stuff. All right, next slide. Um, these meditation in higher consciousness, I told you it was a, a product at one time, a CD that could be sold, two CDs. So I uploaded those to our website. You can go to tfioh.com to the past community classes. And I've been posting all these Monday night classes, but also my Peace Under All Circumstances audio, I think. Anyway, go to YouTube and find all this. Peace Under All Circumstances audiobook is on YouTube. Very valuable during this time, obviously and uh, all the meditations on higher consciousness. Those talks where I gave, I just recorded them into a mic by myself, so not as much passion to them. Um, but they, you know, it covers the content. And again, it's probably about you know, two hours worth of material or so. So there's five different recordings there for that, and all free. All right, here's tonight's topic. To start with the first two words, Vivek and Viragya. And then I want to go back to full screen because I really want to connect with you as much as I can. Uh, but for now, since we got the slide, Vivek is the ability to discern, as I said, one thing from another. So you can discern right now on the screen, this is supposed to be a chalkboard, by the way, in case you didn't know, um, 
on the chalkboard and the screen, there's a blue line and we have above and below. You can discern what's above and below. You could also discern the left side of your screen from the right side of your screen. That's a mental muscle, right? You can see there's text on the screen and then there's the blackboard and you know the difference between the white part and the black part. That mental mechanism is not used by 99.999% of humanity to discern some very important things. So I'm gonna, and by the way, I do this with my clients, those of you who are students in the school who really groove with these teachings and wanna share them with others. Of course, you're more than welcome to. I didn't make this stuff up. I have my unique way of presenting it, but um, this stuff is thousands of years old. It's not well taught in the West, honestly. You know, going to India was a really good thing, but India itself doesn't give you that. I happen to be at a really good ashram that did teach this stuff, I'm gonna say, properly. So uh, feel free to share this with others, of course. What I do with my clients is exactly this, when they're ready to hear this kind of stuff. I will draw a line on a piece of paper and I'll write above the line. I mean, there's lots of different words we'll get into tonight. So the concept is there are things that are unchanging and there are things that are changing. But look around you, like really, like right now, like look around the room and everything you see is changing, right? Everybody's body, if there's other people in the room with you are changing sensations and bodies change, your body is changing, emotions are changing, even your mind is changing. So what is unchanging? Uh, you don't have to answer that yet. Um, but uh, to be able to discern, so how do we find peace, you know, or bliss or joy um, in a world that's constantly changing, in a world that's throwing viruses and tornadoes and fires and poverty and, you know, this is like the below the line, by the way, is the world, is the world you see with your body's eyes, is the world you touch, is the world you live, you think you live in and interact in. And yet, what if there's an unchanging reality? And what if that reality is just not so difficult? <laughs> Above the line, we have what's real, and below the line is unreal. And unreal with the idea of changing, if I said to you, there is a pen on the desk. Well, what if we take the pen off the desk? Right now, um, that statement is not so real anymore. In a changing world, not in this model, I'm teaching yogic philosophy, this isn't Matthew Brownstein theory, so uh, please know, in this model is you know, what I'm saying. But this is my direct living experience. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I meditate all the time, especially during lockdown, and I, I'm living this, so it's very real to me. But below the line is unreal. Uh, and yet, what if there's something that's real, unchanging and real, as opposed to changing and unreal? What if there is something that's true, absolutely true, not debatable, absolutely experiential, or what would be the point of all this? Uh, there's truth and then there's illusion, right? So if I say to any human being, you're unlovable, that's an illusion. Um, right? It's false. It's something I made up, I believe. You know, deep down, everybody is lovable. And people walk around thinking they're unlovable all the time. That's why Gil Boyne, one of my great mentors, called the, what do you call it? Uh, it's like the unspoken secret. You know, everybody's walking around thinking they're unlovable. So that's an illusion. Yet the physical world you're looking at is an illusion. Right? So start to consider that everything going on through the body's eyes is like a mirage. It sure appears to be there. But on the quantum level, if you go deep into what they're teaching, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, uh, it's just a big empty field of energy and probability. There's really nothing there. Uh, it's not solid the way it appears to be. So it's not truth with a capital T. Right? Yet what if there is an unchanging, absolutely real truth? Um, and then how many people spend so up to with three bullet points so far in each part of the line, above and below, Think about most people, right? 99% of humanity, 99.999%, literally, <laughs> uh, are basically caught in a dream, living in a changing, unreal illusion, and so convinced it's real. Uh, that's tragic, actually. And again, most people don't <laughs> live with this awareness. Above the line is eternal, that which is never changing, it's always there. What's below the line is temporary. Right, so if you were to consider the idea of the word God, uh, and again, I'm not too preachy with these classes, because I, when I use the word God, I know everybody thinks religion. And what I'm saying, if I use the word God, I'm meaning what's above the line, an unchanging, real, absolute truth, eternal reality. The, when you put all your attention on what's below the line, the world, uh, but never really what's above the line, 
And then there's that biblical quote, thou shalt have no false gods before me. And it's the first commandment. Why in the Bible is that the biggest piece of advice? <laughs> Think about it. It's not to say a commandment or you'll go to hell. That no, We're not talking that way here tonight. It's good advice. Have no other gods besides God. But if you're only focused all the time on changing unreal, illusory, temporary illusions, then you're not actually in touch with the unchanging absolute truth. And there's a good reason why you want to be, not because you're bad if you don't, because you're suffering if you don't. And this is a reminder for everybody to spend more time with these teachings on the meditation cushion, right? To tap into what's available to you. To go a little deeper and to make it even more practical tonight, what's above the line is the observer. And below the line is the observed. And the next words can help us to understand that. So there's a you right now who is observing the computer screen. And there's a you who is observing what you see and what you hear. You're the subject, right, of a subject-object relationship. Martin Buber, the Hasidic philosopher, he called these I-it relationships. I observe it. And then there's what he called I-thou relationships, which even though I won't go into Martin Buber's philosophies tonight, uh, that simple model of I-thou as opposed to I-it. I-it is I-see-it. But realize every it, which is everything, is an illusion, <laughs> is temporary, is fleeting. And there's nothing, I didn't put this, these words because I want to be able to val you know, describe them, um, what's below the line is actually valueless, and that's hard for most people to grasp, so I don't even put it as a bullet point. Above the line is what's valuable. Think about it. If above the line is an unchanging, absolutely real eternal reality, and I didn't describe the qualities of reality yet, if that is there and available to you, uh, and notice how the word subject is you, like you're, you're that I, you're part of that one reality. Everything else you're observing is an object of consciousness, which will come and go. It doesn't mean we don't have those things in our life. It doesn't mean you don't have really nice objects in your life, but you're not the objects, right? You're the subject. I, I have a car. I have a home. I have a suit. These things are nice, <laughs> but there's not me. What's valuable is the me. But the real question is, who is the me? And that's what we're really establishing in this model. Next. The me, according to yogic philosophy, but again, I'm going to speak from my own very direct experience, is consciousness, right? And from your direct experience, you're conscious, you're aware, you hear me. I'm not talking to your shoes or your toes or your legs. I'm not even talking to your body in any way. I'm not talking to your emotions. I'm not really even talking to your mind. I'm talking to you, the one who hears through your ears. So my voice is an object of your consciousness. The and then it's translated, you know, more translated, yes, but um, transmitted through the internet, and then it vibrates through your computer screen, and in your eardrums, your eardrums are the sense organ, and then there's the consciousness, which is you, right? You're in there, and you hear me, yet the you is so much greater than what the vast majority of humans realize, and that's why we're doing this class. The you, if we're going to give a word to it, is spirit. Now, it's just a word, but it's a very valuable word because it implies a being which is not what's below the line. And below the line is your body, your emotions, and your mind. Right? And now, a lot of people, I believe, think that the body-mind-emotion complex emits mind, emits consciousness, that you're just the result of your body-mind-emotions. That's the biggest lie <laughs> that human beings have ever bought into. It's a huge illusion. I, I want to say, you know, I hear the words before they come out of my mouth. I promise you, you're not your body, emotions, and mind. Mind is slightly debatable how we define it, but how I'm going to define it here when I put it below the line, your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. Your, you know, and those are those divisions don't really mean much in yogic philosophy. But the mind you hear in your head, right? All that chatter, usually, you know, for us in the English language or whatever language you're speaking in your head, is not actually you. It's a voice you can observe, right? So as I'm talking, again, I can hear a lot of the words before they come out of my mouth. There's a me who hears that stuff in there, and I promise you, there's a you who hears that stuff in there, and you, that you is spirit. And when we talk tonight about meditations on higher consciousness, it's to teach you to plunge into that and to experience just how glorious that really is. And some other words that help us to get that. 
above the line. Why, why, why would I care so much about sharing this stuff? Well, you are, I am, and this is not philosophy. Like I, I, I close my eyes and just like right now, just I am peace. I open my eyes to look at the screen, but it's all the same thing. There, I, I am bliss. I am one with that. I am like, there's not one with that. There's only that. And that is love. Some other words. Like, so I invite you for a moment. Close your eyes, if you would. Just close your eyes for a moment. I am too. Just take, I said we would do this, take inventory of you right now. Like, how was your day? Was it filled with bliss? Now, I watch the news too. <laughs> I know, you know, I'm, I live in this planet too. So I'm not in denial of what's happening. But I ask you, even with COVID-19 and everything going on, are you filled with peace? When you close your eyes, are you just bathing in bliss? Do you feel one with your source, one with God, one with spirit? There's an inner voice called super conscious or higher consciousness. Right? That's tonight's topic, meditations and higher consciousness. Do you hear the voice for God within called the Holy Spirit in a lot of traditions? Just your higher guidance, your inner wisdom. So inside of you, as you, is peace, bliss, love, oneness, joy, not fleeting happiness. Because I felt sad this morning watching the news then growing in the grocery store. But I am not sadness. I am joy. I'm happy and sad come and go. So I'm just asking you to take an honest inventory of your insides right now and your life. Because we'll talk about how above and below this line interact. All right. So you have a life, the stuff below the line. How is it? It might not be so good right now. Yet these teachings can make it better. All right, so that was it. You can just open your eyes whenever you're ready. I'm going to show you what's on the screen. We'll finish up with the slides because, again, I want to connect with you. So below the line is pleasure and pain. Like I said, like I was when I was at the grocery store this morning after watching the news, like, wow, this is, I mean, not like, wow, like, like it just, realize but you know this is sad right? this is really sad what's happening right now in the human condition and like so your heart if you're a human if you're open and real will feel sad yet what's above the line never goes away and that's the incredible it seems like a paradox that in the midst of so much suffering i didn't write the word suffering below the line because it's a big topic uh but below the line is clearly pleasure and pain uh, it's called in sanskrit suk and duk pleasure pain and you can't avoid it. It's the yin yang. It's a part of the duality. Below the line is duality. Above the line is oneness. Right? So, uh, like I can, on the human level, can feel pleasure and I can feel pain. I can feel happy. I can feel sad. But that I is just body, mind, and emotions. The deeper self, who we really are, which is really the only self, is bliss. And it's always bliss. That bliss is not an emotion. Peace is not an emotion. Love, actually, is not an emotion. Now, these aren't like different energies. There's one water, but we can describe it differently. The water is cold, the water is wet, the water is clear. But you don't say, ah, oh, there's something called clear and there's something called um, wet. No, like the clear stuff is wet. It's water. The thing called spirit is always peace. And I, I don't hear these teachings enough. I feel like, like somebody's got to be standing in a soapbox. I am right, screaming, you are peace. You can always experience peace no matter what's happening to body, mind, emotions, or your finances, or your career, or even your body's health. And better off tapping into these teachings now before you really need them. I right? like develop these mental muscles now through the meditations and teachings we'll do tonight so that when things are really challenging, you can go back to this. I can give examples, but you know, during difficult times in my life, oh, thank God I knew this. Because, you know, um, I'm hesitating to say if I want to do this with, we're going to finish just this teaching. I want to talk a little bit about the dark night of the soul tonight. I think a lot of people find that teaching relevant. It's a very deep uh, teaching from actually Christianity. So I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, so above the line is everything you've ever wanted to feel. Below the line is pleasure. So sometimes it's good but pain, and then there's gain and loss. So sometimes, yeah, the stock chart went up, hey, my money went up, hey, my health got good. Um, but then we can lose that stuff below the line. And Dark Knight of the Soul actually talks about loss. Um, and especially with certain stages of life, right, where you stop getting more, and it's like life starts taking stuff away from you. 
if you haven't found the peace of your own soul during that process, it's a rough experience. And it's a lot of what the dark night of the soul can be about. When all the things that you thought were valuable are actually being stripped away. And you know, that's like profound if you take that in for a moment. There's gonna be a time in your life, one way or another, where all this good stuff starts going, all right? Uh, you know, health and looks and you know, like lots of things start dropping away at certain stages of life. Thank God there is that one reality underneath it all. And this is just a reminder at any stage of life, especially when you're younger, you know, tap into this. I started learning this stuff in my early 20s. It's caused me to suffer so much less uh, and to feel so much more bliss and joy because of that. Uh, and then below the line is apparent separation. It sure seems like you live below the line. And then, so the question now to ask yourself, let's say you agree that there is an above the line and below the line. There is spirit and matter. Right, we can call the stuff below the line just matter or energy vibrating into form. Let's go back to full screen now. I miss you guys. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. All right. Uh, let me know you chat pot if and something wasn't working. Uh, if not, I'm just going to assume it was and we're still all together and doing well. So um, I hope that was a good introduction to what we're looking into tonight. And the question now is where I'm looking, I feel like I'm looking right at you, is how far is the above the line stuff, right? Is it just like up there in heaven, like someday we get to that? Um, or can you tap into it right now? There's a very, I usually don't quote this sutra because I don't want to confuse people with it. There's a deep Zen sutra. Um, I'll just tell you, you can research it if you want. You probably won't understand it the first time you read it. It's called the identity of relative and absolute. And that's what we're talking about. Above the line is absolute, below the line is relative. And deep Zen meditators understand this stuff. And just like the Heart Sutra of Buddhism, it's chanted in almost every Zen center monastery in the world, uh, the identity of relative and absolute is probably right up there with it as far as popularity, at least within those centers and communities. So the identity of relative, of, of, uh, ident the identity of relative and absolute talks about how the absolute and the relative are like the foot before and the foot behind in walking that each has its own place, and yet we can distinguish the difference between the relative and the absolute. The real kind of like wake up call to this, if you wanna call it that, is again to say, I know, and I think you guys know, most of humanity, like literally, again, I'll say 99.99% of them, don't, they might know this, they might have a religion about it, they might believe in it, they might have faith in it, but how many are living it? You know, where pretty much your most of your time, because you know, even a meditator, that means like I can waver from it, but come back. Yet, if you can come back consistently, the majority of your day, that's beautiful. If not, you are suffering. In A Course in Miracles, the teaching is the only hell for a child of God is to feel separate from God. And so I said, so we can talk about Dark Night of the Soul um, in a moment, but also the idea that What's below, well, yeah, okay. So in the identity of relative and absolute, how do these two levels of reality, below the line meaning not really reality, but how do these interact? The beauty is the more time you spend in the above the line, in spirit, and that doesn't mean, you know, out of your body on some other planet or something or some astral plane. So right here now, the more time you spend in spirit, the better below the line gets. That's the secret. I know the secret, you know, because they coined a book and movie about that. Um, that's not actually the deepest secret. <laughs> the secret of creating and manifesting of the law of attraction is a beautiful, deep teaching, and it's become popular. The deeper secret is the more time you spend in spirit, the better the below the line stuff gets, the better your life gets, and you don't have to really do anything about it. <laughs> you just meditate, you allow. So remember, we have the term vivek and vragya. The vague is to discern the difference between bliss and suffering, peace and suffering, right? And then uh, viragya is to let go of that which is causing suffering. And they say, oh, but let go, uh, it's a sacrifice. I will lose things that are valuable to me, right? If I let go, I'm not gonna have the car and the money and the health and the house. And that's being stripped away from most people right now anyway. Right, so clinging to it in Buddhism and, and deep yogic philosophy is a huge cause of suffering, but it's not a sacrifice to ask you to find deep peace in your own soul, in your own being, as your own being, because that law of attraction, that vibration 
emanates out into what's below the line. And below the line, again, is just your life. So below the line is a big illusion. Sickness is an illusion. Pain is an illusion. Your body is an illusion. It's not who you really are. I right, thank God. Can you imagine if this physical form is really you? That's like saying you are your car. I can get dented. I can get scratched. I'm limited. I'm finite. I can get stolen. I can get broken. I can be abducted. I can get crushed by a big boulder. You know what happens if you're a vehicle? You're miserable if you think you're a vehicle. You might not realize it, but like our insides are pure light and bliss and joy. That might sound delusional, but it's just, it's not. Honestly, it's not. It's your insides are bliss and pure light. And the samadhi teaching I'm going to tonight is to be able to feel that. So let's talk briefly about dark matter of the soul. Uh, most people misuse the term. If you study St. John of the Cross, he was a, I believe, 12th century uh, Christian mystic. And um, I'll give a very brief version of his life. He was training monastics, both nuns and monks, with, um, who was it? Very famous nun, St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, so he was training some of her nuns and monks, as I remember from my religious studies way back when. And he saw the stages that monks, monastics, go through in their training. And they go through these stages of a dark night, like real depression. What most people are experiencing right now, not even most people, some people certainly experience right now, it's not the dark night of the soul, although I'm sure, sure some are for sure. What actually is happening, like if most people said, I'm so depressed because every time I've lost my job, I lost my money, I've lost my health, that's actually called the dark night of the sense. It's when the stuff below the line it's not being stripped away from you. It's just changing and it's impossible to keep it all the time, right? So when you're clinging to that, which is changing and not going to be there all the time, that's going to be suffering. And it actually is suffering. Um, there's a deep point in Buddhist philosophy where people are like, God, oh, it's so pessimistic. The Buddha just said life is suffering. Um, and that was one of the profound truths, one of the four noble truths. But what he really meant by that is your personal individual sense of self that feels separate from all that is, that is clinging to the external world, people, places, things, events, including your own egoic identity, right? Uh, you know, who you think you are. Because I say, I'm a mother, I am a massage therapist, I have great health, I have lots of money. What if all of a sudden you're not a mother and you don't have your career and you don't have your health and you don't have money? That actually isn't the dark night of the soul when that stuff is being taken away. That's the dark night of the sense. It's just semantics. But if you study St. John of the Cross, that's actually what's happening. Dark night of the soul is a much deeper experience that actually most people have not experienced. That's when you've actually found the beloved. You've found spirit. You know what all that peace and bliss and love is inside of you. And for whatever reason, we don't have time to go into it tonight. It's not the topic. It's when that goes away. Uh, when somebody who's been a very long-term meditator, monastic, yogi, you know, somebody's like really plunged into that uh, and is just blissed out, and then all of a sudden that's gone uh, for a period of time. That's called the dark night of the soul. So most people have not experienced that. They're experiencing dark night of the sense where all the material things are being taken away. And again, not being taken away by some evil force. It's just you're living on a planet where everything changes. The Buddha's teaching of impermanence and why suffering comes about because of attachment I'm going to use the yogic model here, to what's below that line. Not Renessa realizing that you are Buddha, and Buddha is that which is above the line. But again, if we say above and below, it's important to understand that's only because you, you have to teach that way. You have to put on the board this and this. But how close is the reality called reality? How close is that truth and that peace and that bliss and that love? In the Quran, uh, the um, Bible, the scripture of Islam, it says God, Allah, is closer than your jugular vein. That's pretty close, right? So I remember even like in you know Hebrew school when I was a kid, there they were talking about God being everywhere. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> where, what, where? I don't see that at all. Trying to find that, and I say trying because it can be a struggle. It's like an eyeball trying to see itself. Like, where am I? I can't see me. I can't appreciate me. You actually can't really see you in the traditional use of the word see, because you're the seer. Yet, it's actually through relationships and doing our purpose and our mission that we really start to see you know, who we really are.
Anyway, um, that was Dark Night of the Soul. A little bit about the concept that if you spend more time in these higher states, what's below the line does tend to harmonize. The biblical quote there, Christ gave it to us, is seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness and all things will be added on to you. I put both eyes in med and we're talking about meditation time, put both eyes on the highest and all the lower levels somehow just balance themselves out. But, you know, again, to help you to understand, because once you start realizing there's above and below, it's not just, you know, only the world. There's this whole other reality called spirit. Hypnosis can start to guide us there. Meditation, which is really what we're getting into tonight, really can take us there. Like, so I'm obviously a huge fan of hypnosis and hypnotherapy. It's great for healing the heart. It's great for facilitation. But you don't spend, you know, um, I'm thinking of sleep time, you know, but 16 plus hours a day in hypnosis, you know, according to like formal definitions. We kind of go into hypnosis, we utilize the state, we come back out. That's the metaphor, the model of hypnosis. Meditation is an all-the-time thing. And so I do define the words differently. Some people are like, oh, hypnosis, meditation are the same. By the way, those who are kind of new to meditation, mindfulness is a very watered-down version of all this stuff. It became more popular, but they had to strip it of all the spirituality. So John Kabat-Zinn uh, with mindfulness-based stress reduction, it's great. It's so good that stuff's out there. Uh, but understand, it's divorced from the spirituality from which it came. <laughs> so mindfulness is beautiful. and People are being more conscious when they're chopping carrots. They're more conscious when they're driving cars. They're more mindful of how they talk to their children. Awesome. Yet, where's the deep, delicious spirituality? It's not in that. And that's why it became so popular, because people are willing to hear about mindfulness. Meditation is so much more glorious than just being mindful of what you say, but mindfulness is included in being a meditator. All right, let's go back to screen share for a moment. So I know I had some other stuff. All right, so we have that slide we saw. Uh, I'm gonna cover all this stuff now, and I just wanna be back on the camera with you guys. All right, so how do we move into what's above the line, basically? That's you know, what it comes down to. I could talk about this for hours, try to motivate you, but eventually I want to get you on the meditation cushion and encourage you to do this. Oh, by the way, I, my, two of my books, The Sacred Geometry Meditation and The Anahat Meditation System, I've been working to teach that stuff since I was about 25 years old. Um, it's actually been quite a challenge to keep that stuff alive, but it never goes away. And this is a good time for me to start launching that. So I'm making a loose but kind of official announcement because I wrote down I'm saying it. Um, I believe Sunday nights, because I teach Monday through Thursday night, giving you your Friday and Saturday nights off to pretend you can go out on a date or something. Um, <laughs> so Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time, I'm pretty sure I want to launch the Anahat Meditation System teachings. It'll be a four-month minimum. Uh, training course. So anybody who shows up totally for free. So keep an eye out for emails or social media or whatnot uh, for the Anahat meditation system. It'll help you to go so much deeper into all this stuff the way it should be done with a teacher who knows what he's talking about over a period of time and ideally with a community. So in Buddhism, that's called the three jewels of Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Uh, Buddha is basically a teacher. Uh, not claiming anything yet, you know, it's good to have a teacher if you're going into deep meditation. And then Dharma, a uh, consistent set of teachings based on these higher truths. And then Sangha, the community of practitioners. So the Anahat meditation system has always been rooted in that idea. So uh, if you join me you know, for that, I'll announce it as we get closer to it, you'll actually be part of a really solid meditation system that will take you into these states. It won't just be a whole lot of talk, you know, we'll, we'll get you to these places if you're committed to it. So what is a Shtang Yog? Uh, the eight limbs of yogic practice, I have all eight listed here. They start kind of from the bottom and they go up to the highest, which is Samadhi. And again, I'll cover as much of this as possible tonight and remind you, if you just type in meditations on higher consciousness, Matthew Brownstein on YouTube, a lot of these teachings are there as well that I showed you before. So uh, yam and niyam, we can cover in one fell swoop. That's basically moral principles and injunctions, ways to live your life that you might say is a healthy yogic lifestyle. That include very basic stuff, uh, good ethical principles, don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, don't misuse your sexuality. 
And then other things, um, practicing a form of devotion to God. It's called Ishvar Pranidhan. So yogic philosophy has that devotional component to it, which is actually worthy of a whole nother two hour class. It's called Bhakti Yoga. Uh, devotional love of the divine is a way to climb up this ladder much faster. Uh, and there's other components, but basically the teachings represented by this triangle are the body sitting in meditation, which goes up to the next word, asan. You probably hear in the West the term asana, um, body practices, hatha yoga, all the stretching and breathing gives you strength, flexibility, balance. You know, it's great stuff. But yoga is so much deeper than that. So what most people know, moving up to the next line, pranayam, uh, it's not just breathing exercises. I'll work to help you to understand pranayama a bit deeper tonight. So asana, there's thousands of asanas, body postures, stretches you can do in yoga practice. Yet the only asana that really matters is called padmasana, which is lotus pose, sitting in a triangle-shaped, pyramid shape, which is what the Anahat meditation, meditation system is largely about, the sacred geometry underlying the human form. When the body sits in meditation, I don't have a good graphic here yet, but by the time May 7th comes around, I'm kind of committing myself to get those graphics ready to show you for my sacred geometry of meditation book. Um, so the body sitting in meditation is asan. It's the only real position that matters. You don't have to, when you meditate, sit in that formal position. You can simply sit in a chair with your spine straight. You could even lean back, but the more you understand, mostly you just need a straight vertical spine. You can try doing this stuff lying down, but honestly, if you practice and you try and experience a difference, uh, it doesn't really work. A lot of people are learning yoga nidra, which is often done lying down at the end of a yogic practice. Uh, but yoga nidra, meaning yogic sleep, if you know what that is, is not samadhi. Um, so it's still kind of basic down a little bit, a little bit lower in this I'm going to call it a totem pole, but it's usually best not taught as linear, yet just like I said about above the line and below the line, we kind of have to do that using the screen. So asan, you're sitting in a meditative pose. During the Anahat meditation system, I'll absolutely teach you how to properly sit meditation. Uh, when you don't know how, it's very, very hard to meditate. Uh, the body posture is really crucial to good meditation. Pranayam, there are tons of exercises. I've taken students through them over the years, but I don't really need to, I don't practice those on my own. Pranayam, prana is energy, life force, uh, shakti, chi. And yam is to, control is not a great translation, probably better is to restrain or to regulate. Um, like it's an inner thing that you do, and there's no really good English word for it. So with pran so in asana, my body goes into stillness with a straight spine. And then, you know, ideally in a lotus pose or half or quarter lotus then the energy, the prana, gets pulled in to one place. Um, and when that happens, you barely need to breathe. So when you really see these yogi, you know, really, oh my eyes. I do want to kind of close my eyes and go with you guys into these states to describe what they're like, because, you know, they're, they're appealing. And if somebody only talks intellectually about them, they're like, oh, well, great. But when somebody can like, show you, like, your insides can be full of light. And this is how to do it, <laughs> no matter what. I'm, I'm on the same planet you are right now. Um, and yet if I can feel peace, bliss, joy, and love in my own being, I must share that with other people, right? If my insides are full of light, and yet I know there's like seven plus billion people who are not experiencing that, right? you know, most of the world is still asleep. They have no idea what really is there inside of them. And if they wake up to that, all human problems drop away. Literally, like, this is the way we can heal the world. Uh, hypnotherapy is amazing to clear all the blockages to love, yet meditation is just a focus on love, right? So that's what hypnotherapy is all about, finding, clearing all the blocks to love. Meditation is just put your attention on love. And you don't have to wait until your blocks are removed to actually find this, but it really helps. So get some good hypnotherapy sessions and clear your stuff and make meditation much easier. All right, moving on, so we can go back to chat pod in the screen. Pranayam, and I'm going to say I because it's just so much easier to teach from experience. I bring my body to stillness. Pranayam, I don't have to do all those funny exercises anymore, breathing exercises. You just regulate the prana. I know that doesn't mean a lot to people, um, but your breath and your mind and your energy are intimately connected. When the breath becomes very still, the inner energy becomes very still, 
there's no mind. You know that crazy monkey mind you have in your head <laughs> when pranayama occurs? There's no mind. And that thing there, like, God, I wish it would shut up. I can't sleep. Blah, blah, blah. It, when true pranayama occurs, the body still and the breath and the mind, the emotions, it's all still. It's not suppressed. It's just clear. But it requires this word yam, this kind of, well, actually, a kind of very intense concentration, which leads to the top three, but we have to go through the next word. So pranayama is to control the life force energy. If you don't know how to do that, um, you're really missing something so valuable is all I can say. Pratyahar, in a good translation is sense withdrawal, right? So our consciousness is focused on the external world most of the time, like, you know, most of the time. In fact, for most people, all the time. Even during deep sleep, that doesn't count as true pratyahar. And your dream state doesn't really count. It's better. You're a bit more internal. When you're in deep sleep, there's no pain and suffering. So that's nice. But you're not awake. It's not samadhi. It's not enlightenment. Right? Everybody's deep sleep. You know, big deal. But thank God there's a little reprieve from all the suffering and the pain of the suffering. With pratyahar, we withdraw from the external world. Or you could say from what's below that line, uh, the line of unreality. And we pull our awareness into our sources, spirit, right inside of ourself. And this is what Shamdhyan or space meditation, space meaning inner space, is all about. So the awareness gets pulled in away from the ears, eyes, nose, tongue, body, sense of touch, all the way up into spirit. Dharna Dhyan Samadhi, those three words together could be not translated as, but explained with a word called Sanyam. Is that the right word? I don't use that word much. I do it all the time. Uh, yeah. Sanyam is this intense, concentrated power. In Zen, we call it jariki. The kind, not really your mind, but your consciousness goes into one point. And I'll explain that tonight when we get to the samadhi teachings. So everything comes into this place of oneness internally. Dharna could be translated as concentration, but again, not really concentrating your mind. But if you're sitting and meditating, or you say, I try to meditate, but my mind wanders too much, then you don't have dharna. You can get to these deeper states, anybody can. By the way, if this stuff is a bit intimidating or deep, I get it, that's why uh, I haven't really promoted all this and why this class is a smaller attendance list. Um, yeah, this thing about not getting it, I was gonna say. Oh, um, when people say I don't do yoga because I'm not flexible, it's kind of silly. <laughs> um, you do yoga to get, it's like saying, I don't work out because I don't have muscles. No, if you want to have more muscle tone, go work out. If you're not flexible, go do the yoga that most people know about. And if your mind isn't at peace, learn how to meditate, right? And, you know, do it for, so um, a little hint in case we don't get in, because it's deep stuff. And if you're just starting with all this, five minutes morning, five minutes evening, you don't have to do it well, just commit to it right now. If you're serious about this stuff, minimum five minutes if you go longer great but minimum in the morning five minutes like after you brush your teeth and wash your face uh, go to the you know, go to the bathroom and then get on the meditation cushion if your life doesn't allow for that as soon as possible you know take care of the kids do whatever you got to do uh, but take five minutes minimum and like do it because if not your ego is constantly running the show when you put a little bit of spiritual practice a little bit of spiritual discipline in there you say, from 7 o'clock a.m. to 7.05 a.m., I must be on that cushion. Now, no matter what's going on in your life, you force yourself to have a meditation practice. We call that in Sanskrit sadhana, uh, spiritual practice, spiritual discipline. Without it, this is all theoretical. Right? So if you don't carve out time to practice meditation, even if you're not good at it, show up, uh, look, you know, look for links for me, because I forced myself to start to teach this stuff again. Um, Sunday, starting May 7th, 2020, um, you know, our social media and our emails and blog and whatnot. I'll be announcing, uh, you know, like a four month commitment to teach very, very deep meditative stuff. So um, I encourage you to get started if you're interested. Just do whatever you can, just sit still on a cushion. You might hate it, but honestly, if you sit on a cushion for five minutes and you hate it, something is very wrong. Why can't you just sit still in silence? Why are you inside so disturbed that you can't sit still for five minutes? It shouldn't be that way. So, um, but you force yourself to do it and then you start seeing the problem. <laughs> um, the problem isn't what's going on in the external world. The problem is what's happening for your body, your heart, your sensations, your emotions, and your mind. And then you realize, all right, there's a lot of work to do to achieve peace, bliss, love, oneness, joy pretty much all the time. It's available, 
but it is a kind of steep mountain to climb and most people just don't do it. Um, so, you know, whatever, those of us who teach this stuff, keep teaching it, uh, waiting until more and more people find bliss inside, then the world would be a much better place. So do it five minutes morning to the best of your ability and five minutes evening. You do asana. Asana is to just take the seat, sit down in meditation. And then pranayam, eventually you start to regulate the breath and the life force energy. Pranayahar, you withdraw all the attention inside. So you pretty much forget about the whole external world, everything below the line, which will include your body, mind, and emotions eventually. Then dharana, intense concentration. Dhyan is a word for meditation, so it's a very hard word to explain because you're like, well, isn't all this meditation? So let's, let's, I'm gonna go into it. You can close your eyes if you want or just, I don't know if you wanna watch. <laughs> so I bring my body to stillness. So I'm inviting you to do the same. No, really no reason to have your eyes open if you like. I'm obviously sitting upright in an office chair teaching. My eyes are closed. So this is our first meditation. I'm inviting you to go with me. The body comes to stillness. This is asan. Lots of body poses and there's reasons for those, but the one that matters is just be still sitting upright with a straight spine. Pranayam. You might hold your breath for just a sec. Don't do it to the point of strain. But when I say prana, so each of these words are like a trigger phrase for me. Asan, my body becomes still. Pranayam, my breath becomes still. When I start, my attention goes down below my navel. That's how the Anahat meditation system starts. And I kind of, these aren't good words in English. I lock the chi. I I contain my life force energy. I'm regulating my breath. And I'm fully in the present moment. There's no past and no future. Fully here now with my breath, but barely breathing. Pratyahar is the withdrawal from the external world. Here my attention goes up, my chin lifts a little, I go more to my third eye region. And I pull all the awareness inwards. You have to know where you're putting your attention, so I'll explain that later. For now, I will say I'm putting my attention on pure consciousness and spirit. And I withdraw from my eyes, nose, tongue, ears, body, up into spirit. Dharna, I immediately hold my attention there. Once I withdraw from the world into what's above the line, into spirit, I focus only on spirit. Dhyan is a movement into that. It's meditating on it. It's putting my attention on spirit. So Dharna, I concentrate on it. I hold my awareness there, but Dhyan goes deeper to starting to melt into it. Doesn't take as much attention or concentration as dhyan starts occurring, because then it's just bliss, and then you just put your attention on the bliss. Samadhi, Anand Samadhi, is meditating on the bliss and experiencing the oneness with the bliss. Pure peace. And to really experience more of the light of this, you go back to some more of that concentration, intense concentrated focus and spirit, all the energy starts coming into one central point. And your forehead essentially is just full of light. You are the light. Anand Samadhi, oneness with bliss, is actually not even the deepest. I'll show you a slide in a moment. Yet deeper than Anand Samadhi is Nirvik Kalp Samadhi. It's called Asam Pragyat Samadhi, no subject, no object. Or Kevalya Avastha, meaning self alone. Only absolute bliss, 
consciousness. There's no words for this, yet I assure you it's the most pleasant thing you could ever experience. Better than anything you'll ever experience in the physical plane. And this is why yogis spend their lifetime in caves sometimes. It's that good. If you're experiencing any of this at all right now, well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> if you're not, I'm really encouraging you to learn how to meditate and know what's inside and know how to feel that. We're just gonna shift. There's really, the only thing that changes right now is I open my eyes is just that, my eyes open. Nothing changes. Like hypnosis, we have this, you go in, you stay in hypnosis, you come out. Meditation, all I did was open my eyes. You don't have to be dehypnotized, right? You're awake and you're awake and you're always awake. It's just eyes are open or closed. Uh, yet, when we practice all the, these teachings, Ashtang Yo, going through these eight limbs, we all the attention gets merged into pure consciousness and then it's not just like this individual point. It's everything. There's nothing but that. All right, let's see what the next slide is. Uh, I'm going to explain samadhi briefly, and then we'll do the rest of it using the screen, and then I'll take you on as many meditations as possible tonight. Uh, samadhi, all these words might not mean anything, so let me define it again. Samadhi is oneness, um, and we can do Vitark, I think you can practice, start practicing Vitark right now. The Tark Samadhi is to put your attention in something physical. Uh, like look at one of the circles. Look at the circle for the Tark. All right, there's what, four, how many did I do? There's a lot of ways to divide this up. I did five divisions today. Um, I did these slides this morning. So the Tark, the circle there at the bottom of the arrow, you could pull your attention on. And that could become, it's not very exciting, but that could be the object of your meditation. Simply stated, because it's kind of complex, deep stuff, when you're just focused on that circle and nothing else in the world, your eyes are open, there's an object of consciousness, just the circle, and you're conscious of it. When your consciousness and the circle are totally one, no past, no future, I'm doing it right now, I'm locked onto it, there's nothing but that circle. I'm narrowing my field of attention. There's no mind, no past or future. And the eye is a separate self, don't exist. There's consciousness, there's the eyes, and there's a circle. And there could only be peace, there can't be fear. Because you're totally in the moment. It's just you in a circle. Okay, you can relax your eyes if you were staring at a screen. I don't know how good that is for your physical eyes. Um, so you can do, I want to teach all this with the bigger um, camera image. I don't know how to do that in Zoom. Can we hold on a sec? Yeah. Oh, well, bigger. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's valuable for you to be able to see me as well. Um, okay, so that's Vitark. Vichar is when you close your eyes, I simply stated, when you close your eyes and you have the mental idea of what you're focusing outside. Um, so I'll explain. The tark is, we did it on the circle, but you could do it on a candle flame that's called tetrak. You could do it with a picture of a saint, right? If you have like a guru who you really are enamored with, um, then that person. Or, you know, if you're Christian, picture of Christ, Buddhist, picture of Buddha, Hare Krishna, picture of Krishna. Um, you know, Hindu, you have plenty of gods and goddesses to focus on. When you put all your attention on that external object, and there's only you and that external object, so this works for any religion, obviously. Uh, like if you're Christian, you just put your attention on that picture of Christ. It's important to remember the picture of Christ, the bearded man, the white man with the beard, is not what he looked like. <laughs> um, but you can focus on that picture, but realizing the picture is not the reality called Christ, uh, but it is a really good starting point. It's usually what most religion is about. Right? So if religion, those like Christian, Christianity, if you were just to meditate on the picture of Christ and not the picture of Jesus and nothing else, like for that moment, you're just totally focused on him, then your religion has actually gone into uh, more of a meditative place where you're actually working to experience him directly. So in Vitark, you realize you're developing a mental muscle to put your attention on the divine. 
But Vitaric, realizing it's still outside of you, and the picture is not the reality, right? The map is not the terrain, but you're practicing to be able to focus on, let's say, the beloved. But you start realizing, well, Jesus isn't necessarily the bearded man with um, the long hair. I won't go into why, but I think a lot of you might understand, you know, it's probably not what it looked like. And a picture of somebody is not actually the someone, right? You see a picture of your kid, it's not actually your kid, right? But if you want to be so, so think about that. You want to be with someone you love, whoever that is. You can look at a picture of them, but you know it's not good enough. In meditation, same thing. If you want Christ, the picture of Jesus is a good start. Having the rosary and doing your prayers and looking at the picture of Jesus is a good start. So again, like deep Christian mystics can utilize these yogic teachings. Um, and yoga teachings, you know, those who practice yoga can benefit from understanding more about the Christian path. But anyway, when we get to vichar, so you have to, for it to be samadhi, it has to be total oneness, nothing else happening, just you and the picture, no mind in between. The only thing that might remain in the deeper teachings is what's called bhakti or devotion. And Christianity, by the way, is a very bhakti religion. It's about devotional love of God through Christ. They said that half, you know, billions of people who do it, uh, works, right? You just put your attention on that one being. But again, this is not one religion tonight. So you can apply whatever you're focusing on Vichar, to the object of meditation. Vichar is when you would close your eyes and see the mental image of the picture. So if it's just a circle, you would close your eyes and probably, you know, right more up here in the third eye region, imagine a little circle, which is not a bad practice, actually. Um, Eventually, you'll start seeing what's called the blue pearl there. This whole chakra opens and lights up internally the more you put your attention there. So all your attention goes inwards, and you're looking at the image, the idea of whatever it is that you're meditating on. A candle flame, you would picture the candle in your mind. If you're high Krishna, you would picture Krishna. Not just a still life picture, but a movie of him doing all the great stuff that he did. High Krishna is the one I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so you put all your attention on that. Now, simply stated, when you do that long enough, you move in, open eyes, you move into the next stage called the Nand Samadhi, which is bliss. So Nand simply means bliss. When that starts happening, it starts feeling really good. You don't care about what's happening in the external world because you're feeling bliss. So all of your attention is held on bliss and that becomes the object of the meditation. Now you're tapping into what Christ really is, right? what Buddha really is. You're entering the gateway where you're feeling the bliss of meditation inside your own self is your own self. It's actually the bliss of the self. It's not the deepest samadhi because it's still dualistic. It's still what's called sampragyat, subject-object. There's a me observing an it when in Vitark. In Vichar, there's a me observing an internal image of an it. In Anand, there's a me observing bliss. So there's still a little bit of ego, but you know, not in a negative sense of self. There's just, ah, oh, here I am, and there's so much bliss. In the earlier stages, there'd be <clears throat> a bunch more spiritual ego, which is a whole other discussion. Um, but eventually, a pure non when it's pure, when it's just a non-samadhi, it's just you and bliss. And you, know, you can do it for hours because it feels so good. You're not bored. You're not lonely. You're just in bliss. And then again, another word for that could be peace, joy, love. But really the most accurate word is bliss. And if you're not feeling it when you meditate, um, you know, there's just still more work to do then. And that's why it's a practice. And you know, really, like to achieve these states, by the way, that we're going to start talking about now, the states that move into asmita or states that are truly nervical, you're talking like, depending on how you do it, 5, 10, 20 years of practice. All right? So don't be intimidated by, oh my God, there's a really long path. Uh, it's an extremely long path to get to experience this stuff on a regular basis. Uh, but you start wherever you're at. If you study the lives of the great saints and sages, they, they tell us, like, this is available to you. Uh, and it's actually a really good practice is to study those people. So Asmita Samadhi, the next stage. As you're focusing on the bliss of the self, you kind of fall back into your consciousness and you're focused in and up and there's consciousness and bliss. It's absolute bliss consciousness. 
and that you are aware that you're aware in the space of bliss. So you start putting your attention on conscious bliss. And asmita means amness. I am. Pure consciousness. The bliss is there, but it's almost like below. The pure consciousness is the most exquisite peace. It doesn't even need to be bliss. It's so good. It's beyond good and bad. There's no words, but the way you can describe it, because it's still a little bit of sampragat, meaning it's still a bit dualistic. There's I, thou. So thou is the divine spirit, and I is also spirit. You might say asmita is the soul observing God or soul observing spirit. And they're just words for a reality inside of who we are. And I'll leave it at that. And then nervic call means without imagination. There's, not, there's no imagination whatsoever. But the only thing that's really gone and true us me, true nervic call is the idea of you. All imagination, including the idea of you, goes away. And what's left is reality. And it'll take years once you're achieving nervicalp states to keep practicing those because they go extremely deep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the explanation. Uh, what else? All right, that's our slideshow. Let's go back. All right, uh, let's open it up to you guys for a moment. So what time is it? <laughs> All right, we're good. Uh, questions, comments, um, thoughts? I'm gonna take a drink and we'll open it up to the group for a moment. Obviously, <clears throat> in the hypnotherapy school, I don't talk about this stuff all the time, but when COVID kind of struck, um, I was talking to some people about this recently, I was like, you know, my whole life, and I think your lives, by the way, um, our lives were made for this. Like, this is what we've trained for. My first new, when I started the conscious community class again, we talked about the Bodhisattva vow. Like, those of us who have been on the spiritual path, who realize we have something very valuable to give the world, like super valuable, uh, need to start doing it. And I know, you know, we have students are, you know, graduates emailing with their financial difficulties and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's heartbreaking to know that people have gone through this school and right now they can't necessarily see clients. And I just see this as we're in training <laughs> and we've been in training and we're going through, you know, a lot of us, you know, once you've gone through the stages of the dark night of the soul, this will not be a dark night for you. When you move through the true dark night of the soul stage successfully, you move into what's called the perfect union in divine love. That doesn't go away, right? Like I'm experiencing the same COVID thing you are out there. Uh, that feeling, that, that being, that way, that you doesn't go away. So a lot of people are going through like real dark nights right now. I'm sure a lot of our graduates are, you know, which is on some level tragic. But if you understand these, these are stages of spiritual growth, um, they're not happening randomly, right? They're, this one reality of spirit is right here now. And all things happen for good once we understand that. That humans, you know, or those of us who are lost in the human experience with our messed up minds, yeah, we're creating a big hell for ourselves. But that one reality of love is still right there. It's almost amazing, actually. It's a good reminder. Like, if you're only watching the news, you see Donald Trump, no comment, and uh, others, you know, that are out there, you look at the world, you're like, there's no God, this is just a big, excuse my French, it's a big shit show, this is like, you know, this is a horror, what is this, this is horrible, how could there be a God if all this is happening, I'm sure a lot of people are going through that right now, um, and faith is good, right, it's helping us to at least believe there's got to be something more, meditators really don't use faith, meditators just live in the reality of God, of course there's God, I don't have to have faith in it, I don't believe in God, I am immersed in it. <laughs> um, you know, he, she, it. It's just pronouns for like the one reality. The one reality is here and it is the healing force. It's why so much of what we do in hypnotherapy is based on healing because that energy is there. So just a reminder to what I think most of you who would be watching this or here now live understand. It's here. And we just, I'm going to say need to. It's not a need like you should do it. Uh, it's neat as if like you know, the most valuable thing of who you are is there. Anyway, 
<laughs> uh, Sarah, I'm not going to say too many names, but Sarah is so special to us. <laughs> Sarah said, thank you, Matthew. Yoga has influenced my life, body, mind, and spirit for the last 50 years. Yep, Sarah's been around the block. She said, I was 33. It's a sacred number. I was 33 when I first found yoga on black and white TV. I've always enjoyed your teachings. Bedtime now. Yeah, Sarah is in her 80s, so we'll let her go to bed. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. And I've been practicing your name, Donna Jana. <laughs> Jana, love is always there. Beautiful, thank you. That's kind of the whole point of this. Um, so you can have faith that love is always there. You can have religion that love is always there. But a meditator just knows how to put their attention on love and to move into it. So, uh, you know, it's a tiny personal note for a moment. I live alone in the mountains. I'm a mountain recluse. I live on the top of a mountain, literally. <laughs> and uh, I'm filled with love, even if I don't see another person for days or many days because of this whole COVID lockdown, there's still so much love inside of all of us. Because I experience that all the time, I know it's true. Like you can't, it's not debatable for a meditator. Um, it's actually kind of tragic when there's a debate about that. <laughs> because I'm saying like, you're filled with love. And if you're not, then A Course in Miracles speaks about the blocks to love's presence. And it's about helping to clear those. Um, so again, hypnotherapy is an amazing way and a great profession to help people to clear the blocks to love. Again, meditation, the deepest sense of meditation is to focus on love. Right? Meditation is what you put your attention upon. And if you just put your attention upon love, you really can't get into a much deeper meditation. All right, great. Danny, who will be our special guest next week. Uh, Danny's our lead instructor and director of our Tampa, Florida location. Danny said, love it. Thank you. I had a conversation with a tree the other day, and it too reminded me of these beautiful lessons. Absolutely timely and relevant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danny, of course. I really look forward to the interview with Danny next week. Uh, yeah, I saw a picture somewhere. It was a woman hugging a tree. It's like, wow, much more people did that. You know, and when you say you're talking to a tree, the word communion, we have the word union. Samadhi is a, I don't translate samadhi as union because union implies one thing unites with another. Samadhi is oneness in that you're already one with the divine. You're already one with the beloved. You're already one with love. So union, you could say, you know, is a way to understand samadhi. Communion is when you as the I are talking to the thou, when you're talking to the reality of it, but not necessarily just in English. Communication's happening all the time. Trees are communicating, mountains are communicating, lakes and rivers are communicating, the stars are communicating. You know, and it's amazing people are so into screens and text, and you know, I'm using this because it's a valuable tool, but I'm, like, I'm never on Facebook, by the way. Don't try to find me there. Um, I, I don't like getting so caught up in that stuff. There's so much richer communication. To sit outside and look at a tree can be awe-inspiring. Like if, if you don't think like trees are phenomenal. Like I live in the mountains surrounded by pine trees. They're awesome. They're communicating all the time. Um, so communion is being in touch with that one reality. I spent a lot of time recently with my paragliding adventures before COVID in South America. I was in Colombia, Costa Rica is not quite down there, but uh, Central America, Costa Rica, Peru, uh, Colombia, and where's the other? Oh, Brazil. And down in the South American traditions, I have this idea of Pachamama, which for those of you who know, you know what that word, you know, you get that word. Similar to Hare Krishna is with the word Krishna. You get that word. Pachamama is like the earth mother, the earth spirit. When you feel that in these indigenous traditions, like Danny's saying, talking to a tree, that's samadhi. Right? But it's samadhi, if you're focused just on the external form of the tree, that's vitark. It's more solid. Vichar is this inner idea of the tree. But you can be with the tree and experience that. And anand is the bliss of hugging that tree. And asmita, again, moving through the stages of samadhi that I don't have in the screen right now, um, Asmita is like I am one with the tree, the tree is one with me. In Nirvikal, you lose yourself in the tree. There's no you, there's no tree. There's just the one spirit that we all are. So again, these are meditative states, but not something you go in and come out of like hypnosis. In, you know, at least the way we normally define hypnosis. In meditate, the deep meditative teachings, it's all the time. All right? Now, it can change. I was saying, I can hug a tree, I can you know, <laughs> sit down alone in meditation. Yeah, really, it's, these are habits you develop in your mind that are always with you. Okay, <laughs> great, somebody appreciated Pachamama, right, <laughs> right on. 
Awesome. Um, Amanda said, uh, sorry, I was trying not to use everybody's name. I am always saying hi to nature, trees, stars, sun, etc. They are some of my best friends. You are showing me there is still such a great access of myself to come. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I don't always promote all this stuff and talk about myself on these levels because, um, you know, we're at North Happy School and we're kind of supposed to do just that. But everything that inspires our school are these teachings. The reason I do hypnotherapy is to help to clear the blocks inside of people, to bring them to this. And our school really paces and leads you know, every student to this. They can go as deep as they want into it, but at least they're introduced to it. All right, so uh, let's spend the rest of the time in more of a meditative mode. We, I gave you about, talked to you about the stages of Samadhi and Ashtang Yoga introduce you to the idea of Virat Swarup. Let's talk about it briefly since um, we did this meditation in one of the recent Monday night classes, but again, you can do it as a guided meditation or you can experience it directly. So I wanna talk about, you can experience it directly. Virat Swarup again is the cosmic vision, the vision of the cosmic self. One of the earliest and most profound um, writings about it, you find in religious literature is in the Bhagavad Gita. They usually call it the Hindu Bible but that doesn't really do justice to all of Hindu scripture. So um, the Bhagavad Gita is a Hindu scripture, very short, like 17 or something chapters. And one chapter is where Arjun, who's considered to be the individual soul, uh, where Krishna, who's considered to be the universal soul, Arjun says to Krishna, uh, I am enjoying seeing you in your kind of human form, because uh, like, you know, this dialogue they're having and he's able to see Krishna, uh, long story, very long story short. Uh, but eventually, Arjun, the individual soul, says to Krishna, uh, this is lovely, yet i like to know you in your true form. And Krishna says, well, you can see me with your bodily eyes, but I will give you a divine eye so you can see me. And then um, Arjun's entire world goes bye-bye. <laughs> and everything he thought was reality is no longer reality, meaning below the line. Time, space, matter is not reality. Um, but he didn't just go to the absolute transcendent, pure spirit beyond the beyond, which is also another experience we can talk about how to get to in meditation. What Arjun was gifted, uh, and really is kind of a gift, the way that experience comes to you, because you can't, you can work towards it, but it really, it, it's kind of like it comes through grace. Um, yet anyway, and it's good to know about. So at that moment for Arjun, the entire universe, the physical form drops away, and he's experiencing the cosmic form. There's no words, but planets, galaxies, black holes, supernova, that would give some sense of what's happening. And then if you study, again, you know, what's in the Bhagavad Gita, and not even close. Another good explanation of this is in Paramahansa Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, where he's praying to his guru, give me samadhi, give me samadhi. And what he's actually asking for is a type of samadhi known as the Swarup, or the vision of the cosmic self, because all Yogananda wanted to do was to know God in the deepest, highest way possible. And, you know, that devotion took him super far if you study his life, Paramahansa Yogananda, or just look up Autobiography of a Yogi. He has a chapter there about cosmic consciousness, and he wrote a beautiful poem to explain what it was like. So um, there's different ways to have the experience. A lot of what I end up teaching later in the school, and the stuff I'm very passionate about is astral projection. When you have the cosmic vision experience, you're not in your physical body. You can't, your body can't have it. It's impossible for eyes and ears to see the whole universe. And more than that, to be the whole universe. Um, you have to be prepared for these kind of experiences. And there's so many other experiences that are so delicious uh, in between just your normal human consciousness and that. The out-of-body experiences that you start going deep in, you're physically, not physically, literally, you're <laughs> not physically at all. You are literally, consciously, and voluntarily leaving your physical body as spirit. And there are many levels to that. It's not just floating around the bedroom. Um, you're flying around your neighborhood, exploring all over the planet, but eventually realizing the physical planet is a very small part of the universe, and the physical plane is a very small part of the universe. Outside of this physical plane, the level above is called the etheric plane. I won't go into all these planes right now, but just know you could explore all these other levels of reality, but the you in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, chapter three, talks about yoga powers that develop on the spiritual journey. And it, it always uh, huge. Uh, anybody who knows this teaching understands you don't try to get the spiritual powers. You don't try to get the spiritual experiences. You learn how to do samadhi meditation. 
and everything that's meant to come along the way, all the gifts, all the grace, all the awesome experiences, what happened? You don't try for the awesome experiences. But um, chapter three is like a little bit of motivation to say, just meditate, you know, on the deepest level possible, and you will have cool experiences along the way. So the out-of-body experiences, the flying experiences, time travel, um, spirit guides, ascended masters, angels, fairies, all that stuff is real. <laughs> you know, that's from my own direct experience. And that should be a motivating reason to want to meditate deeper when the really cool mystical experiences happen. But tonight, this is meditations and higher consciousness to focus on the highest. Um, but I believe opening people's minds, the idea, oh, so I was saying chapter three of the Yoga Sutras, the yogic powers. One of the powers, I didn't understand this in, when I studied it in college because I'm like, what does it mean? It says you can become as small as an atom or as big as the universe. I'm like, no, like nobody's ever made their body as small as an atom. But at that time, I didn't really, I was just starting to study this stuff. I didn't have the direct experience that I am spirit. I'm not a body. My early out-of-body experiences taught me that in a very profound way. Like, I'm not a body. No way. You're not a body. There's no way. You're not a body. You're glorious light and love. You're spirit. Um, as I say it now, like everything's just becoming pure light. You are pure spirit. You're pure light. That's who we are. You're not trapped in this body. In A Course in Miracles, it says, I'm not a body. I am free, for I am still as God created me. So the you is still intact, regardless of COVID. You're still perfect and complete. Bhagavad Gita says you cannot cut you or burn you or wet you or wither you. All right, you're beyond time and space, but you're right here having the time and space experience. But you're not trapped in it. So you can be as small as an atom, meaning your consciousness can shrink down to one little point, but not in a body. So you can like go inside an atom, I guess. I, I mean, I've walked through walls, so technically I guess I have. Um, but it's not I, physical body walks through wall. Me, a spirit, can move through walls and ceilings and anything. So you, you can experience a subatomic level of matter. And once you see it from the inside out of your body, it's not physical. It is an illusion. It's an amazing mirage. It's like the Matrix. That movie was pretty right on to this stuff. But um, it, it's pure light. It's pure love. And that is the healing force, by the way. The more of us who tap into that, less illness on the planet. Very firm belief. Not experience yet because there's still a lot of suffering and sickness and pain. But the more of us who tap into it, you, you don't develop psychosomatic illness. You don't manifest illness. I'm not saying I, you know, whole talk on illness tonight, but really the cure for humanity's problems is to move into these states. Um, anyway, so you can be as small as an atom or as big as the universe. That you who can be as big as the universe literally is your own consciousness. You're not limited to the body. Anytime you want to start practicing, just ask me or go to school or my out-of-body experience workbook is on our website. You can start practicing those meditations. You start having out-of-body experiences and ask yourself at one point, how big am I? Am I as small as the body? And the body's actually pretty big compared to ants. It's enormous giant. <laughs> so this whole time-space thing is totally relative. Your body is actually enormous compared to most things. 70 trillion cells. Every cell would be like, wow, the body is huge. So you're not actually that small. But you're not big or small as spirit. You're timeless. You're boundless. You're eternal. You're immortal. Uh, you're pure, eternal light. It's either true or not true. I think most people still listening believe it's true. So with that said, let's spend time on this. Um, I guess we've got a good half hour. All right, I'm going to take a moment. We have, uh, let's do the Vivekyati meditation first. We'll go into it. We'll come back out. I was thinking, like, are we going to combine all this together? Some of you, I'm sure, have been through this before. I did it in a recent Monday night class. It's one of the most valuable teachings. And even if you say, oh, I know this, it's a meditation, meaning like you, I, you do this every time you meditate. It's just I can take you through it a bit more methodical um but this is exactly it's not exactly what i do um i'll explain <laughs> so you can close your eyes and again many of you have done this before but don't be like ah i've already done this it's boring let it guide you to spirit so we talk about above the line and below the line i'm gonna close the door there's a chainsaw or something way out there i'm not sure if the mic is picking it up or not Okay, so eyes are closed. So listen to the sounds around you. Yeah, I hear a chainsaw somewhere on the mountain right now. You can hear the sound of my own voice. You can hear the sound of this voice. Listen to the sounds. Notice how the sounds are changing. 
Notice how they're objects of consciousness. Notice how they come and go. Notice how there's an it and an I. You're the subject, the sound is the object. You can do that with my voice. Yet in your mind, in your inner awareness, be aware, I hear through the ears Matthew's voice. You can focus just on that, just my voice in your ears, and that there's a you in there listening. It's not your toes that listen, or your feet. Uh, you could be hearing me right now and you don't even have to have feet. So go down there for a moment, focus on your feet and toes. And you might affirm in your mind, I'm not my feet and toes. I'm not my left foot, I'm not my right foot. Focus on your legs, I, it, relationship, subject, object. I'm not my left leg. I'm not my right leg. I'm not any internal organ, right? We could remove your spleen, you'd still be here. You can remove a kidney, you'd still be here. You can remove a lung, you'd still be here. Granted, your body would, well, it's a weight loss technique. <laughs> your body would be lighter, different, maybe uncomfortable. Yet it's not you. Do that to your hands and your arms. Not these hands. Not these arms. Now go to your physical heart. I'm not this thing beating in the chest. It's actually really creepy. I'm just going to say this since we're going inside. If you really focus on the body internally, it's insane that people want these things. <laughs> anyway, another topic. <laughs> You're not a body. You're not blood and pus and all this stuff. <laughs> so moving inside the body, the body has sensations, hot, cold, moist, dry, comfort or discomfort. Perhaps it feels healthy, perhaps not. Just observe it and realize you're not the sensations in your body. You observe hot or cold, moisture or dryness, pleasure or discomfort. So affirm in your mind if it helps you, I'm not anything happening outside of the skin. I'm not even the skin. I'm not the body. I'm not the sensations in the body. And these things don't have to be at peace. Just let them be as they are. That's viragya. Let it go. Just let it be as it is. It'll harmonize itself as you let it go. And now go deeper to the emotional body. It's called your astral body. The emotional or astral body the vibration of emotion where you feel those, we'll call them feelings. Just notice what you might feel. If you watch the news and you know what's happening in the world, there might be sadness there. That's okay. You might feel hurt. Maybe somebody hurt you. You might feel scared. You might be angry. Yet I'd like you to maybe, once you notice those emotions are from in your mind, I'm not the emotions. The human being has all those emotions, but you're not a human being. Notice emotions are below the line. And obviously there's not really a line. There's just a you. Observing a human, bones, skin, hair, nails. Thank God it's not you sensations, emotions. Now keep moving in and up, up your spine. We're starting to practice a bit of pratyahar, withdrawing from the external world, pulling away from the ears. I'm not my ears. So not even mine, it's just a set of ears here. <laughs> away from the eyes, away from the nose, 
away from the mouth, away from the body, but where, what do you mean away from? Where do we go? Inside, between your ears, behind your eyes, behind your forehead. Put your attention behind your forehead. And again, you're aware you're in there. Absolutely guaranteed, you're there. You're not the external sounds. You're not the body and its sensations. That's all down there, below the line. Emotions are down there. Now, to go deeper, Start to observe your mind. There are lots of thoughts in the human system. We'll call that the conscious mind. Your subconscious is more of your heart, your emotions. So subconscious, heart, emotions, memories down there. Then go higher up to your conscious mind. The thinker, the analytical, reasoning, conscious mind. The monkey mind. Yet see if you could observe that voice yapping in your head. It might be quiet right now, yet let it say, here I am, I'm the mind. Just let it keep repeating that, I am the mind. I am the mind. But notice how you hear it say, you hear it talking to you. Let it say, do you hear me? And this is one of my favorites. Let it say, why do you think you're me? You're extracting yourself from the human. You're starting to know yourself, or if you already know, you're meditating on yourself as the self. I am that I am. This is actually the practice of asmita samadhi, one of the highest ways you can practice meditation. Just put your attention on the you. Your mind can keep asking, well, who am I? Who am I? But it can't provide the answer. You can only be who you are. So let's describe that and we'll move into the next meditation. So that's Vivekyati. You can keep your eyes closed if you want. That's Vivekyati, discerning wisdom, discriminating the real from the unreal, truth from illusion. So that's Vivek. Viragya is to let go. So let go of everything that moves or vibrates. Don't hold on to anything. What's real cannot be threatened. What's unreal does not exist. So just let go of all the unreal. Doesn't matter. What's valuable will remain. And now you're finding what's valuable, which is you. Spirit, soul, consciousness. You are light, but don't look for the light. It's like an eyeball trying to see itself. We'll talk about that later. But for now, focus on pure consciousness. This is the meditation on Sham Dhyan, space meditation. The thing to do is only to put your attention on pure conscious awareness. Don't try to stop your mind. Whenever you notice you fell down into your mind and you get caught up in your thinking, you dropped into the illusory past or illusory future, come back into the now and go back up your spine, behind your third eye, the crown of your head, it's easier to find pure consciousness here in the beginning. Find pure peace and put your attention on that peace. You don't have to stop your mind. Just put your attention on that which is higher than your mind. Again, tonight's class, meditation on higher consciousness. Put your attention on the stillness and the peace of your own soul. It's always there. No one could ever take it away from you. Nothing that happens below the line could ever change this. It's eternal. It's always there. It's immortal. It doesn't know what death is. There's no death. It's life. You are life. Love. Again, meditate on it. Not intellectual. 
Intellectual is below the line. Philosophy and religion are below the line. Deep meditation above the line. I am peace. Now, if your mind is having trouble, because it has so much to think about, you actually want to, in the beginning, but almost any stage, give your mind something to do. For now, we'll do something kind of universal together. As you inhale, just think, actually have the thought, I am. Exhale and think, peace. Find the peace, meditate on the peace, yet your mind is learning to say things that are valuable. Inhale, I am. Exhale, consciousness. Inhale, I am. Exhale, pure awareness. Inhale, I am. Exhale, perfect peace. Again, coordinate your breathing with the words, inhale, I am. Exhale, love. I am one with my source. I am unchanging. I am immortal. I am blissful. I am joy. This is how, you can say whatever you want in your mind. There's lots of teachings there. But this is how the deep ones meditate. They put their attention on spirit and they just go there directly. It's a direct path. It doesn't need anything. Just close your eyes. Put your attention on pure consciousness. And that's the meditation. Now, Let's go into the next stage, practicing some more samadhi. Once you find, so you can keep your eyes closed if you like. <clears throat> Once you find the self, which is you. Asin, <clears throat> excuse me, asin, the body posture. The body is very still. Pranayam, the breathing. Very still. Just practice that for a moment. It might bring your attention back to your body a little bit, and that's okay. Pranayama is actually a very advanced set of techniques leading to very advanced internal experience. For those of you who might know, they're what are called the bond. Uh, it's not easy to pronounce this. The bond, or it's pronounced in the West, bandas. There are locks or seals. So those of you who know, Muladhar, uh, Mulabanda, could pull that gently. Dalandahara Banda, pull that, I'm sorry, not that one. Udhyana Banda. If you know these, you'll know, if not, later. So we're pulling the two lower locks. Pranayam, the breath is very well regulated. And the Kundalini Shakti, the energy, the life force, especially in waking kundalini, is directed up the spine. It goes up what's called Shashumna Nadi, the central channel. It goes up the two snake-like channels, Ida and Pingala Nadi. It goes up to the third eye region. And then pranayam, the breath energy is held at the third eye. Pratyahar, now we withdraw again away from the external world. We hold our attention on sham space, the pure space of consciousness. There's really no need for mantra or any technique here in samadhi. You're just holding your attention on pure consciousness. We're in the latter stages now of samadhi, so we move into a non-samadhi, bliss. Just hold your attention on bliss inside. If you're not feeling it, then you know why you practice. Practice, find the bliss of your soul. 
Anyone who looks will find it. It's a guarantee. As you start feeling the bliss of the self, the divine sweetness of the self, you start falling in love with the light and the bliss and the peace that you are. You become a devotee because it's so good. There's a term amrita, it's a nectar, it's a nectar of devotion. It's this, um, the yogis talk of a sweet, a secret gland that secretes this amrita, this inner nectar that drips down the back of the throat in deep ecstatic meditation. Not always, but when it's there, it's good. But it's so blissful. And then moving into asmita samadhi. you become the consciousness itself. It's not like you're a human meditating on spirit. Now you're spirit meditating on spirit. It's really no time and space. Below the line doesn't matter at all. What's valuable is what's above the line. So spirit meditates on spirit. But we'll talk about what's below the line once we go fully through this. And the real secret is there is no below the line. <laughs> Nirvikalp samadhi. Asam pragyat means no subject, no object. Kevalya avasta means self alone. And this is where above and below just drop away. There's only the self. There's only God. There's only love. Here, my awareness isn't only in the higher chakras now. It fills all my chakras. It fills my whole heart, my whole body. Yet, the illusion is seen for what it is. It's an illusion. The reality is the self, you, right here now. It kind of goes full circle but you don't lose the peace, the bliss, the joy, the love, the oneness, and the divine guidance. I'm going to give us a moment in silence and just listen. We're always so busy talking and doing. In samadhi, you're still and quiet. Eventually, it's effortless. And just notice what's happening now. The trees, the mountains, the rivers, the inner reality of spirit, the whole universe is communicating to you. And it guides you if you're just still and you listen. I'll give you a moment in silence just to be still and to know. If you notice you're wandering away from it, then that's why it's called a practice. If you're in it, as it, just keep holding your attention on it. Just be it more, be you more. Just be more light, more love, more peace. You don't see the light because you are it, you're emanating it out. You're like the eyeball, not trying to see itself, you're just being. Knowing that you're being, knowing that your being is everything you'd ever want to experience. And that's the deepest meditation, just to meditate on the one reality that you are, and the one reality which is all that is. So, Kevalya Awasta, a word from the phrase for the deepest samadhi, is that there's only God, and there's only love. Love has no opposite. Now, the part you might not like, but you got to get good at, is in a moment we'll be opening our eyes. It's a very important practice because you don't want to feel that meditation stops. You are the light. You're right here now. 
And in a moment, you'll be very slowly letting your eyes open. And what you're looking on, you could say it's just matter, it's unreal, but really it's, it's all spirit. Take your time very slowly. When you're ready, your eyes might open. Ah, all right. So, you know, they say the eyes are the gateway to the soul, right? So now when you look into anyone's eyes, who are you looking at? Whether they know it or not, right? Like I clearly know something about it. So if you're looking at me, you can say, oh, Matthew is pure consciousness. It's not Matthew, this is Matthew, whatever. <laughs> it's just a name. Yet the consciousness who's here right now is the same self that you are. We're all the same self. So what's really, what does that lead us to? The later stages of spiritual growth, because you do this enough, you're like, oh my God, I'm pure bliss. And you open your eyes, like, I'm still pure bliss. Everyone's pure bliss. Watch the news or wherever you get to see the suffering and the pain happening on the planet right now. When they're, they were fighting with each other in the streets of LA, they're um, taking, you know, assault rifles into town halls. I mean, just like, if you believe what I'm saying, the, they're, they're, they're God and they're lost. Uh, so to me, hypnotherapy is one of the ways that I can still maintain my deeper spirituality and be of service in this world. Through hypnotherapy, I can have a sacred relationship with another human being in a space created for healing and transformation, an uh, intimate space where they can reveal to me how they're suffering and hurting. They can tell me about all their problems and symptoms. I can listen with compassion. Uh, of course, it's a career, you know, which is which is beautiful. Uh, and then not only can I hear their symptoms, I can tap into their emotions and you know, hear how are you feeling? You're sad, you're scared, you're angry. Now remember who we're talking to. This is like you could say child of God, but I want you to feel like it's more than just like a child who descended down. It's like the absolute bliss of the universe is telling me. I'll tell you a quick story. When I first started tapping into this stuff, I was doing yoga back in college. This, uh, a lot of practice by myself, you know, again, deep spiritual practice, not just a yoga class. Uh, and a friend of mine came to, more of a student, uh, came to do yoga with me one day. And I'm in the form, pure light and bliss. There's nothing, just light and bliss, light and bliss. Light. And I open my and everything is light and bliss. And I open my eyes and there's my friend. And all I'm seeing is light and bliss. And he said, oh, lucky you, I'm such a loser. And I swear to God, what I wrote in my journal that night is I was shocked to see God telling me he was a loser. I'm like, what? You have no idea who and what you are. There's something, this is not okay. And that's really what the deep spiritual teachings teachers are. Where we get out there and we tell people, you're not who you think you are. You're glorious. Wake up. Like literally wake up to who you are. You're asleep. In hypnosis, we say, I'm going to put you in hypnosis, put you to sleep. But really, the deeper teachings is we're all here to wake up everybody. And some, a lot of hypnotherapists know that idea. I'm not here to put you to sleep. I'm here to wake you up. But I'm not sure if every hypnotherapist or hypnotist grasps the profound implications of what awakening actually means. So when you're sitting with your client and you hear all their symptoms and their problems, why they came in, and then you hear about their emotions, their sadness, their hurt, their anger, they're angry and attacking everybody. They're blaming everybody. They feel guilty. They're beating themselves up, attacking themselves. They uh, you know, the regrets and the shame and the disgusting, you know, like there's so much horrible judgment inside of most people's meditators, advanced meditators don't have that. There are stages in A Course in Miracles that talk about advanced teachers of God and the qualities in them. It says it's not the peace, the bliss, the love, because that's just who you are. Qualities of an advanced teacher of God are things like trust. The foundation is trust. Trusting spirit is real and all things work for good. It gives you so much more peace inside. Trust, honesty, a major quality of a teacher of God, in A Course in Miracles model, but I think just, you know, true. Uh, tolerance. So these qualities that develop, joy is another one of them, open-mindedness, another one of them, these very valuable qualities develop from meditation. This is why in Zen, all you have to do is sit in meditation. You just sit Zazen, just sit. That's it. If you learn Soto Zen, basically, and you need a teacher and all that, but really what it comes down to is just sit. It's called Shikantaza, just sitting. And then your Buddha nature appears. But to just sit is Buddha nature. And that's a deep Zen teaching. And it's right there on the surface. To take the seat of meditation is Buddha consciousness, is enlightenment itself. When you're, this is what asana is in asana, 
in yogi practice just to sit and you master that one posture, just sitting. You're totally present. You're totally at peace. So in hypnotherapy, my book, The Sutras on Healing and Enlightenment, is designed to help our graduates, you know, our students, to get to that place and then to be a healer for others from that place. Interpersonal hypnotherapy, extremely deep stuff. You know, once you grasp how sacred it really is. Then they tell me, the client tells me about their negative belief systems, their thoughts. I'm a loser. I'm worthless. I'm disgusting. I'm, I have no value. I have no purpose. I have no meaning. These are hellish thoughts. Those thoughts, every single one of those thoughts, any one of those is hell. <laughs> you know, that's like, it's not funny. It's, it's tragic on some level. Unlovable, unloved, bad. I mean, you know how many clients come in telling us that? Every single client who comes in tells us those things. That's not awakened. That's in a, a dream. It's a nightmare. It's a horrible illusion. So what do we as like the deepest level of hypnotherapists do? We awaken ourselves through deep meditation. We go into our hypnotherapy office or online if need be, and we do this work. We do the intake. We hear about their issues, which we can resolve most of the time. Their emotions we can resolve like all the time. Their negative beliefs we can resolve. And um, all these painful memories and block, you know, which are just energy blockages in the heart, we as hypnotherapists can clear. So now imagine you're awakening somebody spiritually. You're changing all their negative beliefs into the truth of who they really are. You're clearing all those negative emotions. So hurt, fear, sadness, anger, guilt, regret, shame. That's just gone. Like that's not, a, it'll pass through the system occasionally, like sadness, you know, I can feel sadness. But the other emotions, honestly, they're just gone. <laughs> they're not suppressed. There's just no need for them in a, to in a clear system. Uh, I don't want to say totally clear. But, uh, you know, in a clear system, you're not holding on to that stuff. The only reason people have all that stuff is because they didn't just let the sadness move through. Um, you know, it's basically what it comes down to. Your emotions are just meant to move through you, but the core emotion is just you got hurt, you get sad. And then when I see other people hurt, I'm sad because other people are hurting. That deeper sentiment, though, is compassion. And when you're in a space of love and you see suffering, then you're moved to compassionate service. So with that, I'm going to do a plug for the school. Our next 500-hour training starts June 24th, 2020. Danny is leading in Tampa. I'm leading in Santa Barbara. And um, I do all the online teaching, all the online tutorials and these, the live classes that occur. Just so you know, in case you're new to this school, I'm never this deep in the school. It's hypnotherapy training. It's super good hypnotherapy training, but I don't break out the heavy spiritual artillery. I respect everybody's spiritual path and um, you know where they're at in the training fundamentals. We don't talk about spirituality, but in clinical training, we get into more advanced metaphysical healing teachings. Uh, and then transpersonal, we spend 100 hours total, the last fifth of the training, 100% on the spiritual themes. All right. Um, it is a two-hour class, so we can run over. I don't mind at all. Questions, comments, uh, sharing. Feel free to log off if you need to. But uh, let's open it up to a bit of discussion. I don't mind running over at all. Two hours doesn't mean anything to me. I'll stay as long as you guys would like to. So let's hear from you if you'd like. I'll give you a minute. Even if this is recording, whatever, just feel free to log off if you've had enough. <laughs> but if you want to hear some question, answer, discussion, I'm very open. Unlike Adobe, which I like to use better, Adobe Connect for teaching, Zoom, uh, I can't see when people are typing. Oh, no, hold on. Nope, we're glum. All right, give you another minute because I don't see anybody typing or anything in the chat pod. And if not, we'll officially at least stop recording. Okay, there's something. Thank you. I won't say your names that I'm reading. So, hello. Uh, thank you. Where'd it go? <laughs> now people are typing. Mm. Okay, she said, thank you so much, Matthew, for that very personal teachings and meditation that you led us through. I've never felt so moved and so close to my source. Then <gasps> that's beautiful to hear. Then the experience that I just had a while ago. I have been struggling in the mind lately in these teachings and meditative experiences, so <laughs> what I needed is beautiful. I'm honored. I mean, that's why we're here. And uh, I'd love to know, you know, in private practice, however we're doing that, online sessions, whatever, the clarity that we have, we can share with others. So that's awesome. And another said, really looking forward to the meditation program. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so keep an eye out for the launch of the Anahat Meditation System. It's, it's my life's work. It's time. 
<laughs> it's really time. I mean, I've been doing it, but it's time for the major next phase. And by the way, that meditation system, um, there's nothing like it. I've never experienced anything so profound. It'll change your whole life in the most amazing ways. So uh, highly recommended when you hear about that to show up for sure. Totally free. Um, that was a nice meditation. I'm celebrating my 50th birthday today and my body began feeling ill. So that was nice. Beautiful. Uh, Course in Miracles line. Affirm in your mind. I get nothing out of illness. Get nothing out of it. Any problem you want to be done with, just be like, I'm done. God, just take it away. I'm done. I don't need it. I don't want it. And then start questioning why you think you might need it or want it. Or why you're self-conditioned to thinking you're susceptible to it. So much of what we suffer with uh, is self-created in one of the deepest ways, but really profound ways. Yeah, Course in Miracles line. I get nothing out of illness. Um, and then, yeah, <laughs> that's the one teaching I'll offer anybody. So awesome. Happy birthday. Okay, again, I'm not saying your names, but I know a lot of you and you mean a lot to me. Can't thank you enough. Awesome. Thank you so much to digest for sure. This recording will be posted probably in a day or two on YouTube so you can go back and listen. But also remember all my meditations and higher consciousness recordings are on YouTube as well. Um, presented, you know, many years ago. So different, slightly different style, but same basic teachings for sure. Great. Very nice. It's so nice to have guidance from a, well, whatever that word was. The word is master, but I'm not comfortable with that word. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, good point. Where can we sign up for the meditation system? You won't have to sign up. Um, I'll just be putting it. So if you follow us on social media, I don't deal with any of that, but we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube more and more, but no announcements go on YouTube. And then um, our newsletter. So if you're not on our newsletter, some of our news, we only populate our newsletter database like once a month, unfortunately. So uh, you might not be in the current newsletter list. If not, contact our school, instituteofhypnotherapy.com or 800-551-9247. So just go to our website and call the school, how Monica put you on uh, the mailing list. And then every week you should be getting our newsletter. I write a blog each week. It announces these classes, it announces stuff with the school, other stuff. Um, but yeah, I'll announce the Anhan Meditation System to our email list uh, and on social media. And then you don't have to sign up, you just show up. It's probably gonna be Sunday nights because that's when I'm available. Uh, Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. All right, awesome. I'm going to stop recording. I'm still here for everybody. Thank you all. I'm honored to be sharing this stuff with you. I look forward to our next connecting next week. I'll be with Danny Fox, um, interview style for this class. Um, we don't know what we're going to talk about, but it's going to be really good. So I hope you guys will be there for that. Have a good night, everybody.